won't you bow and be in prayer with me? Lord, prepare our hearts, our souls, our minds, our lives to be fertile soil, that the seed of your word might be planted deep within and we would, may bear fruit if we do not faint or grow weary. Thy word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. We believe, O oh God, that when we open the pages of Holy Word, that you speak with relevance and with power. Speak, Holy Spirit, for your servants are listening. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Amen. This morning I would that you turn with me to hear what I believe is just a pregnant and powerful word that God would cause us to wrestle with this morning. I want you to hear it as God would speak from the book of the Acts of the Apostles. If you would turn to that fifth book in the New Testament and as we're turning to the 27th chapter of the book of Acts, I want to let you know that today's word is a little difficult and I pray that if it's relevant for you in any way, that when the sermon is over, would you just touch me on my shoulder and say, Pastor, that was for me. That I will know that God's word landed in someone's lap today. When you found the 27th chapter of the book of Acts, if you're physically able, we ask those who are with us to stand that we might reverence the reading of God's word from Acts chapter 27. I want to begin reading out of the New King James Version in verse number 20 and ask that you would keep your Bibles open. I plan to teach and preach from the word this morning. In the 20th verse of the 27th chapter of the book of Acts, the writer who also pens the Gospel of Luke says, Now when neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and no small tempest beat on us, all hope that we would be saved was finally given up. But after long abstinence from food, then Paul stood in the midst of them and said, Men, you should have listened to me, and not have sailed from Crete, and incurred this disaster and loss. And now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For there stood by me this night an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve, saying, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must be brought before Caesar, and indeed God has granted you all those who sail with you. Therefore, take heart, men, for I believe, God, that it will be just as it was told me. However, we must run aground on a certain island. Now, when the 14th night had come, as we were driven up and down in the Adriatic Sea, about midnight the sailors sensed that they were drawing near some land, and they took soundings and found it to be 20 fathoms. And when they had gone a little farther, they took soundings again and found it to be 15 fathoms. Then, fearing lest we should run aground on the rocks, they dropped four anchors from the stern and prayed for day to come. And as the sailors were seeking to escape from the ship, when they had let down the skiff into the sea under pretense of putting out anchors from the prow, Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, unless these men stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. Then the soldiers cut away the ropes of the skiff and let it fall off. And as day was about to dawn, Paul implored them all to take food, saying, Today is the 14th day you have waited and continued without food and eating nothing. Therefore, I urge you to take nourishment, for this is for your survival, since not a hair will fall from the head of any of you. And when he had said these things, he took bread and gave thanks to God in the presence of them all. And when he had broken it, he began to eat. Then they were all encouraged and also took food themselves. And in all, we were 276 persons on the ship. So when they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship and threw out the wheat into the sea. Hang out in verse number 22. There will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. Do me a favor. Before you sit down, play preacher to your neighbor. Tell them, neighbor, neighbor. old neighbor, neighbor. Sometimes, sometimes things, things fall apart. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Things fall apart. 
The book of Acts gives us a record of the three missionary journeys of the Apostle Paul. After being converted on the road to Damascus, Paul is assigned by God, empowered by the Holy Spirit, travel throughout the Greco-Roman world preaching the good news of Jesus Christ. And in the latter half of the book of Acts, as you read it, I implore you to do so when you get home, you'll find the record of Paul traveling to cities like Corinth and Ephesus, of Antioch, of Macedonia. And in these three missionary journeys, Paul establishes churches to which the letters you read and the subsequent books of the New Testament are written. Well, by the time you get to chapter 27, Paul is not on his third missionary journey, he's on his fourth. And Deacon Bender, this is the journey that will lead Paul to Rome, where he will stand before the emperor and ultimately be executed. To understand what happens in chapter 27, you need to rewind a couple chapters and allow me to give you a cliff note version of the events that trigger the text we read today. In chapter 20, Paul has completed his missionary work in a town called Ephesus. And when Paul is finished preaching in Ephesus, he calls the church together to let them know that he believes the Holy Spirit has assigned him to go back to Jerusalem. The Ephesian elders try to persuade Paul not to go back to Jerusalem because they know there's trouble waiting. For the same Jews, the same Sanhedrin council that crucified Jesus now has their targets set on Paul. They try to tell Paul, don't go back to Jerusalem. And Paul gives them a verse that's one of my favorite in Scripture. He says, none of these things move me. Neither count I my life dear unto myself, that I might finish my course with joy in the ministry I have received of the Lord Jesus Christ to testify of the good news of God. I'm going back to Jerusalem. Paul sets sail. And Siobhan, he lands in a town called Tyre. And when he gets to Tyre, the church gathers together, and for the second time, Paul is warned not to go back to Jerusalem. They plead with Paul, don't go back. Paul, however, is under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, so he leaves Tyre on his way back to Jerusalem. When he gets to Caesarea, for the third time, he's warned not to go back. In Caesarea, he is met by a prophet by the name of Agabus. And Agabus takes off Paul's belt. And Agabus ties his hands together and shows them to Paul and says, this is what's going to happen to you if you go back to Jerusalem. Paul looks Agabus in the eyes, and this is what he says. He says, I am prepared to be bound and even die for the name of Jesus Christ. Karen, Paul makes his way back to Jerusalem. When he gets to Jerusalem, he's met by James the brother of John, one of the original disciples. And James tells Paul, here's the problem. The Jews think that you have been out preaching against the laws of Moses because you have told Gentiles they don't need to be circumcised as the law of Moses describes, and the Jews are angry because they believe you have violated the laws of Moses. Paul then purifies himself, and goes into the temple. While he's in the temple, a mob gathers outside. And the mob has come to kill Paul. They're angry because Paul has allowed Jews, excuse me, Gentiles, to enter the body of faith without being circumcised, and they believe that Paul has taken a Gentile traveling companion by the name of Trophimus into the temple. It is a violation of the law of Moses for a Gentile to be in the temple. And they've come to kill Paul because Paul has violated the laws of Moses. This mob gathers, a riot ensues, and an uproar comes out of Jerusalem. If you remember anything from Enemy of the State series, 
you ought to remember that when there are riots in Jerusalem, Rome gets involved. And so word gets to the Roman general named Lysias that there's an uproar outside the temple. Lysias shows up with a Roman army, puts down the riot, and grabs Paul. Paul tells Lysias, I demand to speak in front of the Jews. Paul stands up and in Hebrew begins to preach to them about his life. He tells them, I'm a Jew, I'm a Pharisee, and I was on the road to Damascus, and the Lord called me, and the Lord claimed me, and the Lord told me to preach. Paul tells his testimony to the Jews. When the Jews hear Paul's testimony, they demand Paul's death. When you read it, it is reminiscent of the cry, crucify him. The same crowd that put Jesus on the cross now wants Paul stoned to death. Lysias wants to give Paul over because he doesn't need the Jews in a riot. And when he's getting ready to turn Paul over to the mob, Paul invokes his Roman citizenship. Paul says, Lysias, hold on. I am a Roman. And Lysias knows he's got a problem because he can't turn a Roman over to a Jewish mob unless all hell break loose. So Lysias puts Paul in jail. And on the next morning, Lysias convenes the Sanhedrin Council. The same council that convicted Jesus is now called to hear the case of Paul. Teach the Bible, Pastor Weston. When the Sanhedrin gathers together, they demand Paul's death. When Paul gets up to defend himself in front of the Sanhedrin council while Lysias is listening, Paul recognizes that the Sanhedrin is split between Pharisees and Sadducees. And in what amounts to a politically brilliant move, Paul plays the Pharisees against the Sadducees. Paul knows that the issue that divides them is the resurrection. And so Paul declares that he's a Pharisee who believes in the resurrection of the dead as the Pharisees do, knowing that the Sadducees reject the resurrection, which is why they're sad, you see. And, and a debate breaks out between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and they're no longer arguing about Paul. Lysias puts Paul back in jail while he tries to figure out what to do. When Paul is in jail for the second time, we find out that a conspiracy to kill Paul is a brew. Bible says that there are 40 devout Jewish men who make a vow before God that they will neither eat nor drink nor sleep until Paul is dead. Forty men stood at the altar and said they will neither eat, drink, nor sleep until Paul is dead. And here's the conspiracy they set up. They send word to Lysias and ask that Paul be brought back to the Sanhedrin council because they've set an ambush believing that when Paul is on his way from the jail, they will ambush and kill Paul before he gets to the council. They have set Paul up. But Paul's nephew gets word of the conspiracy. Because whenever the enemy tries to set you up, God always knows what's about to go down. Go on, preach, Pastor. So Paul's nephew goes to Lysias and says, listen, you can't send Paul to the Sanhedrin council because there's an ambush of 40 men who made a vow to not sleep, eat, or drink until Paul is dead, and they're going to try to kill Paul. Lysias knows he can't send Paul to the Sanhedrin council. So Lysias sends Paul to Caesarea to be tried by Felix, who's now the governor of Judea in the replacement of Pontius Pilate. Paul is sent to Caesarea. He meets with Felix. 
Felix brings the Sanhedrin leaders to Caesarea to hear their case. They argue why Paul should be killed. Paul defends himself, and Felix knows that there's no reason to kill Paul. Paul is innocent. But Felix can't let Paul go without causing a riot in Jerusalem. So he keeps Paul in jail in Caesarea for two years. He believes that, that maybe the Jews will just forget about him. And Mark, he hopes that Paul's followers will raise enough money to bribe Felix and pay him to let Paul go. While Felix is waiting on a paycheck, he is replaced as governor by a new governor named Festus. You need to read your Bible. Festus comes to reign, and Festus realizes that Felix left him with a Paul problem, that Paul is still sitting in jail, and the Jews still want him killed. And so Festus does what Felix did. He brings the Sanhedrin council up to Caesarea that he may hear their case. Paul argues his case, and Festus knows that Paul is innocent and there's no reason to kill him. While Festus is trying to figure out what to do, he says to Paul, don't you want to go back to Jerusalem? Paul says, as a Roman citizen, I don't want to be tried in Jerusalem by the Jews. I demand my right to go to Rome and stand before the emperor and tell the emperor about Jesus Christ. Paul demands to go to Rome. While Festus is trying to figure this thing out, he's visited by Herod Agrippa II, the grandson of Herod the Great, who tried to kill Jesus as a baby. It's all coming together now. <laughs> Festus is visited by Herod Agrippa II and his wife Bernice. When Agrippa and Bernice come, Festus brings Paul out, hoping that Agrippa will help him figure out how to deal with Paul. Paul begins to preach about the good news of Jesus Christ, and Herod Agrippa says to Paul, you almost persuaded me to be a Christian. And both Festus and Agrippa agree Paul would be let go had he not demanded to go to Rome. And since Paul invoked his Roman right to go to Rome, Festus has no choice but to send Paul to Rome to face the emperor. And in chapter 7, Paul is on a ship headed to Rome. I ain't lost you yet, have I? And that ship has had problems from day one. Storm after storm. Contrary wind after contrary wind. Mechanical difficulty after mechanical difficulty. They've had to reroute. They've had to go around different islands. They've had to navigate through storms. This ship has been plagued with storms. And in the verses I read for you, Paul has received a word from God that he's got to share with the captain, the centurion, the soldiers, and the prisoners. It's a word nobody wants to hear. In the middle of the storm, on a ship, Paul gets up and this is what he says. He said, hey, I got some bad news. This ship ain't going to make it. The vessel we're in is not going to take us where we hope to go. The thing we've given ourselves to will not survive this storm. I know we've been praying and I know we've been fasting, but God wants you to know that sometimes the ship you're on is going to fall apart. Uh, that, 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 
That, that's not the word I want to hear. I want to hear God tell me everything going to be all right. I, I, I want, if I just hold on a little longer, it's going to get better. But sometimes God gives you undeniable evidence that the ship you're on is falling apart. That, that, that this thing is about to end. This thing is being broken up. This thing will not make it where you thought it would go. This thing is going to come crashing down. And at some point, you're going to have to get off the ship. Now, 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 let me tell you why it gets quiet. Because you'd rather me prophesy that, that God's going to fix it. But sometimes God's word is, it's falling apart. And, and, and the reason it's hard for the sailors to receive that word is the same reason it's hard for somebody to say amen right here. Because they had high hopes in the ship. Because don't nobody get on a ship thinking it's going to fall apart. Uh, if, if you knew it was going to fall apart. If, if you knew it would end like that, you never would have said, I do. If, if you knew it would go down like that, you never would have given yourself to them. If you knew that they would lay you off, you never would have accepted their offer. If you knew they would stab you in the back, you never would have befriended them. If you knew that child would not do what you prayed for them to do, you would have done some things differently. Nobody gets on a ship thinking it's going to fall apart. And it's hard to accept, accept that the ship is falling apart when you've been praying for the ship. When you had dreams of happily ever after. You had dreams of sailing into your sunset years. Only at this stage of your life for God to say, the ship won't make it. It's hard because they had high hopes can I push it? It's hard because these were skilled sailors. Th these weren't rookies. Th these weren't freshmen. They had sailed through storms before. And the problem is they believed they had the skills necessary to save the ship when God said it's got to fall apart. Let me tell you why your pew gets quiet right here. Because it's hard to accept the ship is going to fall apart when you think you've got the skills necessary to make it work. And somebody, the reason this word is difficult to digest is because pride has convinced you that as long as you give it your best, it ought to work. That as long as you give it your all, it ought to survive. That if you go to therapy and you pray right and you lay hands on it and y'all do what you got to do, that somehow or another God is going to save it. But sometimes God's word is, no, this ship is falling apart. And I don't care how wise you think you are, how smart you feel you are, how many lessons you've learned, you don't have enough skill set to save what God is allowing to fall apart. It's hard when you got high hopes. It's hard when you think you know how to save it. But watch this. It's also hard for the sailors to accept that the ship is being destroyed because the ship has made it through so much already. My God, we've been through storms. We've been through contrary winds. We've been through rough waters. And the problem is when you've been through all of that, you reach a point where you convince yourself, I've been through too much for this ship to break up now. I didn't put in too much work. We have forgiven too much. We've worked through too much. We've reconciled too much. We've been through hell. And after you come through hell, the ship shouldn't break up now. 
And somebody you're holding on when the ship's falling apart because you've just been through too much. And it's hard to hear the Lord say, the ship is breaking up. Now, what you ought to be asking is, why is it falling apart? Why does God allow things to fall apart? Why doesn't God save everything we're praying for? Why doesn't God fix everything we're in? Why doesn't God make it work? Why doesn't God save it? Why does God allow some things to fall apart? And that's why I tell them that's a good question. That's, that's a good question. <laughs> Can I tell you why Paul's ship is falling apart? I'm going to give you a reason because God says, listen, I told y'all in Crete not to sail. And I don't care how much you pray and how skillful you are and how much you've been through, the destruction is the inevitable consequence of the disobedience. And because you did not heed my word, there's but no choice for this ship but to be destroyed because you did not obey what I told you to do. Come, come, come here, come here. Watch what he says. He said, listen, I told you not to sail because winter was coming. So your first problem is you sailed in the wrong season. Um, you're headed in the right direction, but it ain't the right time. And because you're in the wrong time, I've got to take you back because you're not moving according to my time. Uh, uh, uh. This was not the time to set sail. It was the time to sit still. This was not the time to say I do. This was the time for you to be by yourself. This was not the time to start the business. This was your time to work and learn the business. But because you moved out in the wrong season. Mm. Can, can I push it? He says, not only did you set sail in the wrong season when I told you not to go, but watch this. You got on the wrong ship. Come here, come here, come here. Because see, that ship wasn't made to sail in the winter. And you got on board something thinking you could make it do what God never ordained it to do or created it to do, but you tried to make it what it wasn't. Can I preach? I want you to read chapter 7, 27, when you get home, you'll find out that the ship, ironically, is from Alexandria. <laughs> don't look at nobody, don't look at nobody. Uh, and here's what the Bible says, that they, don't miss this, they found the ship. Um, this wasn't ordained by God, they found it. This wasn't what God planned. They found it. This wasn't what they prayed for. This is what they found. That this was not a ship ordained by God. This is something they found and decided to get on. And when you're on something that you found, but God didn't ordain, you don't have any choice but to watch it fall apart because if you found it, that's what you wanted. But if it was prepared, it's what God wanted. And God said the problem is you're sailing on something you found. Hmm. So, Lord said, this thing got to fall apart. But, 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 but I got some good news. I, I, I. Hi, hi, Will, I, I got some good news for somebody that's on a ship that's falling apart. I, I, got, I got some hallelujah good news for somebody that's on a ship that's falling apart. Because God doesn't just say the ship will fall apart. Watch what God says. And what I'm about to share with you is the, the easiest amen in the sermon. If you don't say amen right here, I want you to leave the sanctuary. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Yes. You got to get out of here because here's what the Lord says. He says, Paul, the ship won't make it, but you will. Hey, 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 
Here's the easy amen. The ship won't survive, but you will. The ship won't make it to Rome, but you will. Because my hand ain't on the ship, but my hand is on you. Hey! hey. If you believe that, touch somebody, tell them I'm gonna make it. My ship may be breaking, but I'm gonna make it. I may be by myself, but I'm gonna make it. It may hurt like, but I'm gonna make it. Cause God's hand is on me. Can I push it? What, what I'm about to sh drop, uh, only about only about, about, about five of y'all gonna get, but I'll wait for the rest of you to catch up. God tells Paul, watch this, not only will you make it, he said, but everybody on the ship is gonna make it because of you. I'll wait till you get it. Paul, there's some criminals on the ship, but they're gonna be blessed because you're on the ship. Oh, there's some folk that don't know Jesus on the ship, but they're gonna be blessed because you're on the ship. There's some co-workers that don't go to church, and they're gonna reap the benefit of you walking in the building every day because the blessing on your life, the anointing on your life, the favor on your life is so strong that it blesses other folks who don't even know God. Uh, hey, hey, can I tell you something? That, that, that's a good word. Because somebody in church today, uh, uh, you, you know some folk around you that show enough ain't no good. You know some folk that are low down. Ratchet and wretched. You know some folk that ain't got no business living the kind of life they're living. And every time you see them in that new car with their new bag and their new boo, you trying to figure out why God is blessing them. The answer is simple, you. So do me a favor. The next time you see the unrighteous blessed, don't get jealous, don't get angry. Just walk up to them and say, you're welcome. Because you ought to be thanking me that God blessed you because I'm in your presence. Is there anybody here that knows my pew is blessed because of me? My section's blessed because of me. The sanctuary's blessed because of me. God's blessing is on my life, and it blesses everybody else. says, Paul, the ship ain't going to make it, but you will. And, and in order for you to be all right, Paul declares that there's some things you got to do when your ship is falling apart, uh, that, that when it's coming crashing down, and when you know that all hope is gone for it to be saved. The Lord says, in that difficult moment, there are at least five things you got to do. I'm going to give you two this week, and I'm going to pray for God not to call you home to glory so we can come back next Sunday and finish up. Here's what the Lord says. When things are breaking up and falling apart in your life, number one, be careful of your counsel. Um, let me break that down. Uh, watch. Who you listening to? Be careful who's giving you advice. Um, uh, uh, Cause uh, if you ain't figured it out by now, you can't talk to everybody. Cause everybody doesn't know what's going on with you. And you've gotta be cautious of who's got your ear when things are falling apart. 
Beloved, because when things are falling apart, the devil knows you're vulnerable. The devil knows you're susceptible. The devil knows you're desperate for somebody to sympathize with you, for somebody to lay hands on you, for somebody to give you a word that the Lord told them to tell you that it's going to be all right. And the devil will surround you with people who mean well, but have no discernment of what God is doing in your life. I got scripture to back that up. You read your Bible, you'll be a better Christian. You'll find out that the children of Israel were in Babylonian exile. And when they got there, some false prophets showed up. Go and read Jeremiah when you get home, chapter 29. False prophets showed up and they told the Jews, you'll only be here for a few years. And God came behind them and said, hey, don't listen to them. I did not send them. What they say sounds holy, but it's not for me. Okay, that didn't get you. Job is going through the going through. And he's got some friends, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. They show up trying to tell Job what God has said. And God comes back and says, hey, don't listen to them. They don't know what they're talking about. All right, that didn't get you. Jesus is on his way to Calvary. And Peter stands in the way and says, Lord, I will never let you die. And Jesus says, get thee behind me, Satan, because I know you mean well, Peter, but you don't know what God is up to because everybody speaking is not sent by God. All right, all right. So, so if I ain't lost you yet, you ought to be asking a question. You ought to be asking, how do I know who to listen to? When things are falling apart, how do I know who God is using and who God ain't? Uh, uh, when, when things are breaking down, how do I know who I can trust? It, it's right here in the text. I teach it to you because when they were in Crete, Paul told them not to sail, and that was God, and they ignored it. When they're in the storm, there's some soldiers trying to get off the ship, and Paul says, if you get off, you'll die. And now they listen to Paul. Catch it. When Paul spoke the first time, they ignored him. When Paul spoke the second time, they aligned themselves with what he said. The first time, they didn't see God in Paul. The second time, they believed Paul was speaking for God. What happened to make them realize they could trust Paul? Well, the answer is clear. In verse number 29, the Bible says that they dropped anchor and everyone on the ship, watch this, prayed for day to come. And after they prayed, they realized God was talking through Paul. Okay, you missed it. On the front end, they had not prayed and they didn't know who to listen to. But after they got off their knees with God, they could hear someone speak and know that that person was God speaking to them in another voice. Because if you want to know who to listen to and you want to know who you can trust, you've got to start with your own time, on your own knees, in your own prayer. And when you pray to God, you'll know whose voice you can trust. Now somebody tell them you need to pray. The more you pray, the more you discern who God is speaking through. The Lord says when things are falling apart, be careful of your counsel. But watch this, this deep, the second one, and be consistent in your Christianity. Uh, uh, keep doing what you know you're supposed to be doing. Uh, Theron, th th I want to see how many people catch this. W watch what happens, watch what happens. Uh, they're in the middle of the storm. Paul says, we need to eat. Right? In verse 35, watch what happens. The Bible says, Paul took bread, gave thanks, and broke it. Okay. Uh, verse 35, Paul took bread, gave thanks, and broke it. Uh, Paul took bread, 
gave thanks and broke it. Now, now, if you've read your Bible and you've been to church on the second Sunday, you ought to be having a flashback right here. When was the last time you heard somebody take bread, give thanks, and break it? It ought to take you back to the upper room when Jesus gathered his disciples together. And the Bible says that the Lord on that night took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and commanded his disciples to take bread, give thanks, and break it until the day that he came back. And so in the middle of the storm, in the Adriatic Sea, Paul decided I'm still going to do what Jesus told me to do, to take bread, give thanks, and break it, because I'm not going to let the storm change my Christian behavior. Come, come here, come here. Shh, 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 come here, come here. The problem with so many saints is that their Christianity is a casualty of their crisis. That the minute the storm comes, you stop doing what you know a Christian ought to do. So, so there and they, uh, they, they, they get in, in a bind, things are falling apart, and, and, and they stop coming to choir rehearsal. Because they feel they ain't got nothing to sing about. Uh, uh, they stop going to Sunday school because ain't no point in staying an extra hour after church. Uh, they don't even come to church no more because you, you're so frustrated by what God is allowing to happen in your life. And the very worst thing you can do in the midst of a storm is change your behavior. you got to be consistent with what God called you to do. Don't you stop praying. Don't you stop worshiping. Don't you stop praising. Don't you stop reading the Bible. Don't you stop singing. Don't you stop serving. Keep doing what God told you to do. Uh, um, because Siobhan... The devil's deepest desire when things are falling apart, watch this, is not to kill you. The devil's deepest desire is to change you. The devil gets no glory out of your death. Because when you die, if you know Jesus, you're going someplace to join an angelic chorus. There's no victory in Satan for that. His victory is found when he allows the storm to change your character. When he allows the crisis to change your personality. Somebody that you know I just slid up in your living room because everything you've gone through you know has changed who you are. You look in the mirror and you don't even recognize yourself. You've never been this angry. You've never been this bitter. You've never been this cold-hearted. You've never been this selfish. And you allow what they did to you and said about you to change who you are. The devil loves it when their ugly makes you ugly. The devil loves it when their mean makes you mean. The devil loves it when their nasty makes you nasty. And I'm looking for some saints that have made a decision that no matter what my storm, no matter what I go through, no matter what they say, Ain't nobody going to change me. I am who God made me to be. I am joyful. I am peaceful. I am bubbly. I am happy. I am generous. And no devil is going to change me. Mm. I got to leave you now. Goodbye, saints. May the Lord bless you mighty good. But the Bible says that not only did Paul take bread, but the Bible says he gave thanks in the presence of everybody else. Paul, stop, rewind, you missed it. He's in a storm and he's giving thanks. The ship is falling apart and he's giving thanks. Things are not going the way he prayed and he's giving thanks. All hell is breaking loose, but he's giving thanks. Because there's some folk who made a decision. I will bless the Lord. Go and help me preach my sermon at all times. And his praises 
shall always be in my mouth. Is there anybody here who's made a decision that no matter what my storm, I will bless him. No matter what my situation, I will give him thanks. Is there anybody here who made a decision that I will bless the Lord at all times? Hey! Goodbye, saints. May God bless you mighty good. But somebody is sitting down wondering how can I praise God when my ship is falling apart? How can I give him glory when all hell is breaking loose? The Bible says that when you take bread and you break it, that you do it in remembrance of him. How can you praise God? Remember him. Remember the ways he's made. Remember the prayers he's answered. Remember the doors he's opened. Is there anybody here that remembers what the Lord has done and in the midst of your storm can still lift a hand, can still say thank you, bless his name for what he's done, bless his name for the ways he's made, bless his name because he's been good, he's been good, he's been good, is there anybody here that knows you got a reason to bless his name right here and right now, bless his name, hey, 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 hey. Come on, if you're not, won't you stand? Listen, here it is, it's real simple. I know you had hopes. I know you've given it your all. I know you think you've been through too much. But Paul said we had to realize that all hope of saving the ship was gone. This is probably the toughest word for somebody to acknowledge when all hope is gone. That's not the word you want to hear when you come to church. Someone's supposed to tell you differently, but the reality is that sometimes God needs you to open your eyes to the fact that a winter has come. Nothing's going to grow in this season. This is the season to sit still and let God work. Here's the good news. When the ship doesn't make it, you still will. And that, so let's say in this season, this, I want you to be, I want you to be careful of who you listen to. You, you, this is the season to pray more than you ever have. Because you need to know when God is speaking. And when others have just given you their best advice. And be committed to who you are. Stop allowing this storm to change you. The worst thing that can happen at the end of a storm is you come out bitter and broken. Angry and cold hearted. Guarded with a bad attitude. Be who God made you to be. Would you pray with me? I need to sow and seal this into someone's heart today. Someone, the word of God has just found you and now Satan wants to pull it out because he can't allow you to have this word in your heart. If you have this word in your heart, you won't give up. If you have this word in your heart, you won't change. With this word in your heart, you know that you'll still make it. So God, today I want to pray over my brother and my sister who walked in this place today with a ship that's falling apart. In spite of their prayers and all their effort, winter has come. And it's evident that all hope of saving the ship is gone. 
Lord, that's the toughest reality to acknowledge. But I'm grateful in your word you say to us that when that ship is broken, you'll still survive. So Lord, I pray now that you would encourage someone's heart, seal someone's mind. Let someone leave today knowing I'm going to survive this. Because even when God's hand isn't on the ship, God's hand is on my life. And for that, I give him glory. So leave this place doing what you know a Christian ought to do. Pray tomorrow morning, open your Bible. Get yourself back in church next week. Be at Bible study on Tuesday. Go to your job, determine you're going to be who God made you to be. Don't let the devil change you. In Jesus' name.